Good afternoon. The Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia will now come to order. Well, I welcome our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, and members of the Subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. Today's hearing will examine the recent progress, or lack thereof, uh, of restoration program at the Spring Valley uh, development. Discu we will discuss the uh, current and future criteria that will be used in declaring the site clear of environmental health contaminants and assess the level of transparency and or community engagement associated with the cleanup. The chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to the second of what will be a series of oversight hearings on the federally, federally related District of Columbia issues, which the subcommittee attends to hold during the first session of the 111th Congress. At the urging of the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, today's hearing was convened to discuss the latest development in the cleanup and restoration of the Spring Valley formerly used defense site located in the northwest quadrant of our city. For decades, re residents living in the community surrounding Spring Valley and the campus of American University have had to endure the disruptions of their land and their livelihood as the Department of Defense, the U.S. Army, Corps of Engineers, the Environmental Protection Agency, and local D.C. governing agency have worked to remedy various environmental and health hazards stemming from past usage of the 661-acre site by the United States Army for the development and testing of chemical agents, equipment, and munitions during World War I. While wholly unacceptable by today's standards, the U.S. Army closed the doors on the Spring Valley site immediately following the conclusion of World War I, and instead of responsibly disposing of these dangerous materials, the agency simply dug holes in the ground uh, buried the site's remnants and walked away. Well, nearly 90, 90 years has passed since the days of the American University Experimental Station and Camp Leach, yet even today, ordnance, me metallic debris, uh, chemical agent breakdowns, and unexploded munitions continue to be, to be discovered, investigated, and in most cases, removed from the Spring Valley site. To their credit, since 1993, since the 1993 discovery of buried ordinances by a local utility worker and the premature termination of field work in the 1995 Site Clean Declaration, the Corps and its partners have made substantial progress in cleaning up and remediating Spring Valley. With over $170 million spent, the Corps has removed thousands of cubic yards of arsenic-contaminated soil, disposed of hundreds of munitions and ordinance-related debris, identified and investigated dozens of points of interest within Spring Valley, all while attempting to keep the community informed of the project's progress through the Spring Valley Restoration Advisory Board. Despite the gains made over the past 15 years in restoring Spring Valley, the fact of the matter is that a great number of questions and concerns continue to persist around the Spring Valley cleanup process. The methodology and science employed the level of transparency involved, and the Corps' proposed timeline for field work and or project completion. Today's hearing is intended to get answers to some of these critical questions and problems and to bring about the ultimate environmental restoration of Spring Valley and the reassurance to its residents that the area no longer poses potential harmful and hazardous health risks. I appreciate the participation of today's witnesses and, more importantly, having their assistance in helping the subcommittee ascertain what future course of actions should be taken with regard to Spring Valley, this Spring Valley cleanup project. I now yield for five minutes opening statement to the ranking member, uh, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding these uh, hearings today. In 2001 and 2002, the old District of Columbia subcommittee, then chaired by Representative Connie Morella, held hearings on the status of the cleanup of contaminated sites in the Spring Valley area. Today we will revisit some of those issues discussed in those hearings to see what sort of progress has been made and what the prospects are for the future. 
After the United States of America declared war against the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1917, the Spring Valley area was used as a testing site by the Army for munitions and chemical agents. It is now referred to as the formerly used defense site. Today, Spring Valley is home to the American University and hundreds of homes first developed in the 1920s. In 2002, the GAO issued a report on the environmental contamination and uncertainties which were continuing to affect the progress of the Spring Valley cleanup. The report evaluated the health risks associated with the hazards identified and removed from Spring Valley and evaluated the Corps' estimated costs and cleanup schedule. It is important for all to know and for the witnesses to address whether or not there are remaining health risks and to, and to clarify the duration and costs of the cleanup. Clearly, the federal government has a responsibility to make sure the contaminants are removed in their totality. I look forward to hearing from the status of the Spring Valley cleanup from our distinguished witnesses. I thank you all for your participation, your willingness to be here, and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize really the person who has been the catalyst uh, for the ongoing work, uh, someone who has spent far more time than I have on this issue and has really done a, a fantastic job, in my opinion, uh, in, in, in representing the people uh, of, of Spring Valley and, and the entire district. And I, I must say that uh, if I were someone living in, in D.C., if I were someone living in, at the Spring Valley neighborhood, I would be very happy with the way uh, Ms. Eleanor Norton Holmes has handled her responsibility. I would, be, I would feel very reassured uh, in the way she has handled this issue and her, her absolute vigilance on behalf of the people that she represents. It's, uh, it is heartwarming to see. So with that, I recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman, for those very gracious comments. Uh, I very much appreciate Chair Chairman Lynch's willingness to schedule this hearing early on our subcommittee agenda. I listed Spring Valley as one of my top priorities in a letter to the chair as a legislative year began because of the national and local importance of confronting federal responsibility for informing residents of toxic substances in communities, particularly when the federal government itself deposited them there and has an undisputed responsibility to clean the area and to shoulder the burden of proof of showing that the area is again safe. I appreciate that beginning in my early years in Congress when I was in the minority, this committee has held every hearing that I have requested to assure that Spring Valley, that the Spring Valley neighborhood surrounding uh, American University is cleared of World War I chemical and other weapons by the Army Corps of Engineers. I asked my colleagues to put themselves in the position of my Spring Valley constituents who have worked hard to purchase homes in one of the district's most attractive neighborhoods. By sheer happenstance, a utility worker discovers a cache of old weapons and in short order they are identified as buried chemical ordnance left behind by the Army. There are similar areas called formerly used defense sites or FUDs around the country where munitions have been buried and uh, cleaning is necessary. However, they are usually far from densely populated areas. We know of no other FUDs in a major city where a residential area was developed uh, around and on top of the FUDs without the government disclosing that it had buried pot potentially harm harmful munitions. Munitions also were buried in other areas in the district, in northeast and southeast, but Spring Valley is the largest uncleaned residential area here where munitions were buried. Yet at the time, there was no doubt, at the very time when this, this testing was going on, there could have been no doubt that this area, where American University, after all, was already located, would be even more fully developed. The history of Spring Valley is long and convoluted, but, it, but at its core is the Army's decision during World War I to use this area northwest uh, in the district 
for the first dangerous tests and experiments with its new and developing chemical weapons program. The decision to locate a major chemical testing facility and then to bury the debris, unexploded ordnance, and chemicals on the site here was no accident. The district had no local government, and its citizens could elect no one to speak for them in the city where they lived, and no one to represent them in the Congress which collected their taxes. The federal government itself ruled the city using federally appointed commissioners. Thus, the Army was free to do here what it could not do in Maryland or Virginia or any other state close to a residential area. As many of uh, the then 800,000 district residents, as many as 800,000 district residents had no vehicle for information on what the Army was doing in their city and no right to know. The District of Columbia was for uh, all these wartime chemical experiments what poorer nations are today when they receive landfill garbage, scrap metal, and other waste that Americans uh, do not want in their communities. As the Spring Valley community more fully developed, the Army continued to fail to inform the district or the Spring Valley residents of the munitions and the possible dangers they might pose. In fact, during the 1950s and again in the 1980s, American University and others raised concerns about buried munitions in Spring Valley, but it was not until 1993 that the Army Corps finally declared the site a FUDS, but only after a utility worker uh, accidentally stumbled upon buried ordnance. Since that discovery, the Corps has left Spring Valley twice, concluding that no large hazards remained. Both times, the Corps had to return for more cleaning. Only the oversight of this subcommittee has assured continuing cleanup of Spring Valley. Now the Corps of Engineers has again announced to the community that it intends to leave the area in two years. However, Mr. Chairman, the Corps neither informed this committee, despite our oversight over the years, or me, the city's only elected congressional official, uh, I learned of the Corps' intention from my Spring Valley constituents. The Corps had no right to announce its exit without more, especially considering the many errors and mishaps so far and an absence of transparency over the years that borders on suppression of information. Neither Congress nor the community has seen the Corps' two-year exit plan or any evidence that the area has been cleaned. Appropriate oversight by the Environmental Protection Agency has been in question. The decision to destroy the munitions on site raises a host of additional issues. No objective evaluation has been done to assure that this time there are no more ordnance in the area. This hearing and any others that may be required seek and must obtain the answers the district and the residents of Spring Valley are entitled to have before the Army leaves the nation's only residential site it once used to develop chemical munitions. I thank our Spring Valley witnesses, um, Greg, Greg Bermel, Nan Wells, Thomas Smith, uh, Kent Slowinski, and Harold Bailey. I thank the Army, the Army Corps, the EPA, the GAO, the D.C. Department of Environment, our expert ordinance recovery expert, uh, Mr. Barton, and uh, President Kerwin of the American University. I very much look forward to, th to hearing from each and every one of you.
Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent for the testimony of Congressman Earl Blumenauer to be added to the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, now I'd like to uh, welcome our first panel. Oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I'm sorry. Before we go to that, I, I, I apologize profusely. Uh, now I'd like to give five minutes to the distinguished gentleman from California, my friend, uh, Mr. Bill Bray, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I noticed this hearing uh, kind of caught my eye for a lot of reasons, not just because we have a Spring Valley in San Diego County, too, but um, I'd like to inform the delegate that um, this isn't the only urban area where munitions are specifically an issue of, of, um, in a residential neighborhood. Um, in San Diego, if my memory uh, chogs me, we actually in the 80s lost some children to um, unexploded munitions. And um, in San Diego, we've got many locations that are now residential that were active military operational with, with live munitions in many different forms, and in a lot of forms we don't understand. And even though we had two senators and countless amount of uh, congressmen in, in, in California, uh, the fact is that federal reservations tend to have that degree of autonomy that is mandated by the federal, uh, by, by constitutional law. And when those lands are turned over for private development later, um, we do have these issues. Uh, just a note that one of these sites in San Diego is actually the site of the Uni um, University of California at, at um, La Jolla. And uh, so even, even the, I think this issue really kind of points out that this is not just an issue of the disadvantaged and the poor. This is a problem where even the wealthy and the powerful can run into this problem, as we've run into in certain places in California. And obviously, uh, th this is one of those neighborhoods that everyone would never think would have a problem um, looking at the homes. Uh, but I think that we need to address that. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you, uh, we still have discussions in San Diego of watching the canyons after the major fires that just occurred a few years ago, utilizing those fires as a way of going down and searching to see if there's any more munitions in the neighborhoods where our children are playing. So I just wanted to uh, reflect the fact to the delegate um, that uh, she is not alone on this. D.C. is not the only community uh, that has to face these challenges. It may have different challenges, but I think the issue that um, uh, a post-military utilization of property is going to be a challenge we have for a long time. I want to make sure that we approach this in a manner that does not create an attitude especially among our, our military, that once property is used by the military, you don't dare allow civilian use in the future. I, I don't want this, uh, this to create a defensive mechanism, and if not downright paranoid mechanism, that we can't allow it ever to be used again, uh, because there's a lot of good uses after military use. It's just appropriate handling and addressing these issues. Obviously, eliminating the problem before civilian use is always the preferred state. But even then, there's going to have to be a sensitivity of constant monitoring. And, Mr. Chairman, um, a good example is the fact that as we recycle sand in, in California, the issue of military munitions that were laying at the bottom of a bay that no one knew about being an issue to where we th recklessly threw away millions of metric tons of good uh, recycled sand because of the paranoia, in my opinion, of the munitions, rather than addressing this appropriately. And hopefully we'll be able to move forward and address this item in an appropriate manner. It's obviously been one that's been on the, um, the front burner for a long time, and I appreciate this hearing. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Okay, now uh, I, I would like to welcome our, our first uh, panel. It is the custom before this committee that all witnesses to provide testimony before the subcommittee uh, are sworn. Could I please ask you each to rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Just briefly, some ground rules. Uh, the green light in that little box in front of you in the middle of the table uh, will, uh, the green light will indicate you have five minutes to provide an opening statement. Uh, the yellow light, when it 
clicks will indicate that you have one minute remaining, and then the red light indicates that the time allotted for your statement has expired. Uh, I'll, I'd like to provide just a brief introduction of the first two witnesses. Ms. Anu K. Mittal is director of, with the Natural Resources and Environment Team of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. She is responsible for leading GAO's work in the area of water resources and defense environmental cleanup. Mr. Harold Bailey is currently assisting Washington, D.C. residents threatened by improperly disposed munitions. Mr. Bailey's projects have involved the application and enforcement of U.S. environmental laws, such as the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Endangered Species Act. Ms. Patel, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting us today to provide some historical context and a national perspective for the Spring Valley cleanup. As you know, Spring Valley was designated as a formerly used defense site, or FUDS, in 1993 after ordinance was discovered by accident. Further investigations at Spring Valley found additional hazards, including arsenic-contaminated soil and lab waste. By April 2002, the Corps had removed over 5,600 cubic yards of soil, 667 pieces of ordnance, and 101 bottles of chemicals. In 2003, the Corps also discovered perchlorate in groundwater at the site and installed over three dozen monitoring wells for sampling. Since 2002, the Corps has continued cleanup at the site and has removed large quantities of contaminated soil and hundreds of lab-related items and munitions debris, as well as some intact munitions and containers. In fiscal year 2002, the total cost to clean up Spring Valley was expected to be about $147 million and take about five more years to complete. However, seven years later, cleanup is still ongoing, and the estimated costs have increased to almost $174 million. Since we issued our Spring Valley report in 2002, we have conducted several reviews of DOD's environmental restoration program nationwide for both active installations and FUDs. Our work at the national level shows that the concerns identified at Spring Valley are not unique and are, in fact, common to many sites across the country. Four key themes emerge from our work that we believe are directly relevant to the Spring Valley cleanup. First, shortcomings in the use of available data can lead to poor decision making. The Army's conclusions in 1986 and 1996 that there was no evidence of large-scale hazards remaining at Spring Valley were made without the benefit of all available information. Our nationwide review of FUDs found similar shortcomings in the Corps' use of available information for, ma ma for making decisions at over 1,400 sites across the country. We found that the Corps either did not obtain or overlooked or dismissed information that might have indicated the presence of a hazard. Recently, a major association of state regulators has noted that these problems continue to persist. Second, incomplete data on site conditions and emerging contaminants can interfere with the development of accurate cost estimates and schedules, just as the cost estimates at Spring Valley have increased almost eight and a half times since the initial estimate of $21 million was developed, developing cost estimates for FUDs and active installations across the country pose a similar challenge. This is because DOD often has incomplete information on site conditions when it first makes cost estimates, and as more information becomes available or as new contaminants are discovered, estimates must be revised and can thus vary significantly over the life of a project. Third, funding availability for a particular site may be influenced by overall program goals and priorities. Spring Valley is just one of the over 4,700 FUDs nationwide that DOD is in the process of cleaning up. However, Spring Valley has received priority funding due to its proximity to the nation's capital and high visibility. This is usually not the case with most FUDs, and they must compete for a slice of a relatively small funding pie. Although funding for FUDs has been relatively stable over the last decade, it is well recognized that the level of funding available cannot meet all cleanup needs. 
Finally, better coordination and communication with regulators and property owners can increase public confidence and facilitate effective decision making. In 2002, we reported that the Corps, EPA, and the District of Columbia had made progress on Spring Valley by adopting a partnership approach and establishing a means of communicating with the public. However, we have found that this kind of communication and coordination does not always occur at other sites nationwide and can significantly hinder cleanup progress. In response to the findings and recommendations that we have made over the last six years, DOD has taken actions to modify its procedures and improve its guidance. While we have not evaluated DOD's implementation of our past recommendations, in depth we are reviewing some of these issues as part of our ongoing work, which will be issued later this year. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, experiences with DOD's National Cleanup Program and the Spring Valley Cleanup tell us that environmental restoration is a daunting task, but that there are lessons that can be applied to the process that can make it more effective as we move forward. This concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Mr. Bailey, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am here today on behalf of several Spring Valley families who were unaware that their children were playing in soil laced with arsenic or that those children could find containers that once held poison gases. I am holding a piece of a container of phosgene gas found by Francis Hansen's young child in their backyard in 2002. The Army and American University who had rented a house to Ms. Hansen failed to warn her and other Spring Valley families about the potential exposure to uh, AUES weapons of mass destruction, despite the historical, photographic, and physical evidence in their possession. My law firm uh, assists government officials who are assessing contamination left by the U.S. military, so let me explain why I think the Army and AU need to do more research to locate and remove WMD in Spring Valley. There's a 1918 photo of, of the American University Experiment Station taken by Sergeant Maurer showing ceramic containers and metal drums near a burial pit located uh, near the current boundary of AU and Glenbrook Road. There was a criminal investigation into the Army's activities in Spring Valley in 2000, and EPA investigators learned that the Army had obtained this Maurer photo in 1993. So for 16 years, the Army has known approximately where the Maurer pit is, but has not been able to locate its location. Uh, in my experience, photographic evidence of a large burial site with metal drums means that advanced geophysical detection devices could locate that site. But uh, as uh, the NC commissioners will indicate, the past geophysical detection methods used by the Army don't have the capability to locate burial sites at deep depths or in hard to reach locations. Without these more advanced geophysical methods to locate the Mar pit, Spring Valley residents will always have a nine feeling that a WMD site could be within several hundred yards. Uh, one child in the Dudley family who played in the dirt in this area experienced acute skin irritation, uh, similar to the symptoms exposure to lewisite. The Dudleys were never told of the Maurer photo and never warned that the Army had found live shells on their property. The May 1920 minutes of the AU trustees records AU's acceptance of a proposition by the U.S. government to compensate AU. Articles in the AU Courier newspaper explain that the Army had dug a pit deeper than the one into which Jacob was cast, Joseph was cast, for the burial of $800,000 in chemical munitions. There are three points that indicate that's not the Maurer pit and neither have been found. There's no extremely deep pit that's been found. Uh, the munitions valued at $800,000 in 1919 dollars haven't been found. And burying large amounts of explosively configured munitions along with mustard gas is not exactly a safe practice even in 1919. Particularly troubling is that the Army and AU knew about the potential presence of WMD since 1986, when an EPA historical photographic analysis showed ground scars indicating burial pits on or near AU. The 86 report was credible evidence of potential danger to Spring Valley families, but this report was not disclosed until many years later. It reflects a pattern of failure to warn and failure to disclose material information under legal standards. Let me summarize the AUES uh, lawsuits that uh, Congresswoman Norton asked me to cover. Uh, first, uh, recovering compensation from the U.S. government for uh, disposal of, uh, of uh, munitions is unlikely 
under the judicial interpretations of the Federal Tort Claims Act. The AUES ex uh, disposals are considered non-compensable discretionary acts, regardless of the dangers that are created. Second, uh, AU is not protected by this discretionary act exemption. AU, in fact, settled a lawsuit after a federal judge found that AU failed to disclose information about the burials to a home buyer. Third, uh, the parties settling the various lawsuits have sealed their court filings in many cases, thus preventing public disclosure of what the litigants know about AUES burials. And finally, the lawsuits have been a, a blame game where the protection of public health and the environment of Spring Valley has not been addressed. The litigation is focused on monetary compensation uh, rather than claims involving the Army or EPA for failure to comply with federal environmental statutes that govern cleanups at, uh, at FUDs. In July 2001, AU sued the Army for $86 million. This lawsuit was an unsuccessful attempt to shift legal liability, but the fact is that AU had accepted the government's 1920 propositions and compensation. In conclusion, I believe that this subcommittee has the authority to ensure that advanced scientific techniques are used to locate the most dangerous WMD sites at Spring Valley, and I ask that Congress uh, ensure that these techniques are used before our Army stops its investigation or remedial activities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, I will now yield myself five minutes for an opening question. Uh, Ms. Mattel, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, at least the first mistake, first of uh, several mistakes on the part of DOD, is that they did not make a good assessment uh, of the likelihood that munitions or other uh, uh, mustard gas or, or uh, any other harmful substances were actually on the site. Uh, and yet they issued a no action necessary and a rather uh, clean uh, uh, assessment of, of the site. Is, is, that, is that due to the fact that uh, the records that, that could have been reviewed were, were classified, or was it just uh, a, a lack of initiative on the part of, uh, or an assumption made by the DOD, if you can determine what was at the basis of that uh, significant error on their part? What we have seen when we've looked at um, the Corps' decisions to make a site or claim that a site does not require further action is that oftentimes they just don't look at all of the information that they have available to them. When they made the decision in 1986, they had actually sent information to EPA to, uh, they, had act, they had photographs that they had contracted with EPA that they wanted EPA's guy input on, technical input on, and those photographs were not received by EPA until 1993. But the Corps had already made a decision in 1986 that they were going to go ahead and say that this site didn't need any further action. And that was what we found at the national level as well, that when we looked at no action indicated sites across the country, we found that in 38% of the cases, the Corps either didn't obtain the information it needed, it had incomplete files, it did not conduct the site visits that it needed to do, or it just ignored some of the information that it had available to it. And what we found was that it's usually, it, a, lot, a large part of this was because the guidance that the Corps had developed was not very explicit on what they needed, what, um, investigators need to do in terms of looking at the documents, what they need to document, and how they need to assess the documentation. So that's why we recommended that they definitely needed to improve their procedures and improve their guidance. Mr. Bailey, any, in, you've, you've been deeply involved in this. Uh, you, do you agree with that assessment? Is that sort of where, where they went wrong? I, I do. I think there have been numerous examples where there was information available. I mentioned this 1986 photographic analysis uh, that I think should have been widely shared. There was a great deal of information available that didn't get to the right places. I agree with that. Let me ask you then, each of you, do you think, uh, having been involved in the process since uh, 1995 and going forward, uh, do you think that uh, DOD has changed their approach, has done, you know, you mentioned uh, an inadequate guidance existing prior. Uh, have we 
we got our act together here? Uh, well, we know that the that DOD and the Corps have made changes in response to our recommendations. We have not gone back in and done an in-depth evaluation to see if those changes have resulted in positive action. What our concern is that a recently a, a, a state association of waste managers basically came out and, and found that they are still very concerned about the NDI de decisions that DOD and the Corps are making. So it sounds like the problem still exists out there. We just have not gone back and taken a look at it. Yeah. Mr. Bailey? Uh, I have uh, significant concerns that there are some potentially serious burial sites that have not been thoroughly looked at and from the perspective of historical eyewitness uh, and other information. Uh, if we don't look at that information and they close it again and it comes up again, then we know we will have failed again. So I would encourage the Corps uh, and NAU to, to uh, use advanced uh, geophysical techniques, to use additional research techniques to get uh, to the questions that I've raised in my testimony. My written remarks, there were six sites that I think that are important that have not been properly analyzed, as your question suggests. Also, the destruction of chemical weapons that's going to go on this summer. Uh, there is a question, uh, I believe, in the community about what exactly is going to go on with that destruction. I recognize their national security concerns about destroying chemical weapons and the information, but I think that uh, some of the ANC commissioners are going to be testifying later have serious concerns about what chemicals are coming into the district, uh, what's being destroyed and what's going to be leaving the district, and where the chemical weapons after they are neutralized are going to be sent for ultimate destruction. Thank you. At uh, this time, I'd like to yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the GAO issued a report on the Spring Valley cleanup and testified before a subcommittee back on uh, June 26th in the year 2002. Um, and I recognize you may not have participated in that, maybe you did. Uh, in the GAO's prior testimony before Congress, it was stated that the, there was data on 58 properties in the District of Columbia where, quote, hazards resulting from federal activities have been found, end quote. Do you have a sense of, is that still the case and how much progress has been made on any of those uh, cases? We. Cur we currently are doing work looking at the whole FUDS program, and we are collecting information, but we have not completely analyzed that information yet. We'd be happy to share that with you as we develop the information that we have. Yeah, given that there were 58 properties within the District of Columbia that were identified previously, we would certainly appreciate an update on you know, the bigger, broader scope of everything that's happening within the district and, and uh, what progress, if anything, has been made in, in terms of those cleanups. Um, including the location of those uh, those uh, outstanding sites. Uh, Congress was also told by the GAO in 2002 that, quote, a number of independent uncertainties continue to affect the program of the Spring Valley cleanup, end quote. Can you give us further insight into the specifics from your vantage point, uh, Ms. Mittal, uh, regarding uh, what has been cleaned up and can the community be given definitive answers about any remaining health risks or costs or where your perspective is as to how far along this, this progress is? Unfortunately, we have not done a comprehensive assessment of Spring Valley since 2002. Most of the work that I have cited is at the national level where we've been looking at the FUDS program and the overall defense environmental restoration program. Is, is there something that's going to be specifically done? Is there target date as to when you think? I mean, is, is this something this that's point, close to completion? Or? At this point in time, we have not done a thorough reassessment of the Spring Valley cleanup. I, is there one in there progress? There is not one in progress, and we have not been requested to do one, so I really can't give you the more detailed information that you're requesting at this time. Okay. What, what, what would your, Mr. Bailey, if you had to highlight your biggest concern moving forward, if you had to really highlight, this is my number one concern, what would that be? Uh, Congressman, the uh, area at the corner of Glenbrook Road and Rockwood Parkway, I'm a, I'm a super fun lawyer and I'm used to dumps and messes. Uh, that and, whole and area, you're an attorney. So. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid so. But uh, uh, that whole area is a dump site. And uh, the trouble is that there is credible historic evidence of uh, uh, burial pits that could contain 
chemical weapons, uh, containers of mustard gas, or uh, large amounts of explosively configured chemical munitions. If uh, the Corps never finds very deep pits and dispels, maybe there's nothing there. Maybe it's all leaked out. Many things happen at dump sites. But until the Corps finds those pits, we will never know. And those are uh, inhabited places, the Korean ambassador's residence is there, there are other residences around. So uh, until the day comes that the Corps can find these deep pits or completely dispel uh, the, the credible evidence that we have that they're not there, then we won't know. And that's, uh, like I said, I said the gnawing feeling that we would have after they left. And, and as I recall, you, did you say that you thought that there were six of these? Uh, in my, testi my written testimony uh, goes to the six sites that I think are the most important. Uh, obviously, there's areas of concern that have been looked at over the years, many. Um, in terms of priority now, those are my, uh, based on my experience of 10 years at the project, those are the ones that seem to be the most important ones. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Mattel, do, do you agree with the new cost estimates uh, for the, corp, the Corps, the Army Corps' two-year plan uh, that is using uh, as it proposes to exit? The numbers that we have are we got from the Corps' um, report to the Congress. We have not gone back and independently evaluated whether those numbers are accurate. Well, the, I think that in light of uh, your testimony about the, how, un, how, how the Corps has um, underestimated the cost of, of cleanup, that would seem to be um, important uh, to do. Um, uh, Mr. Bailey, um, I, I'm concerned about your testimony about the deepest uh, it looks like deepest um, buried. Um, you, it's it's clear that they, that you, that they what you say they were either buried and they may no longer, of course, be viable, uh, or 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 poured out. Where would they have been poured out? Yes, Congresswoman, this is an example of a container that at one time was in, intact and probably contained a phosgene gas o over time or even at the time. It was broken and the contents uh, were released. Uh, those of us familiar with chemical weapons know that oftentimes when the chemical re weapon is released, um, it's neutralized and no longer harmful. Uh, but the trouble is we don't know. We don't know whether they're intact containers buried. We don't know whether there are explosive munitions buried. That we haven't found. What did the Army give as the reason for, um, for not finding the moral pit? Well, I, I concur it's a difficult technical task because some of these things could be down 20, 30 feet. And uh, the type of geophysical uh, uh, detection devices that I use in my practice uh, in Superfund might not reach. What about <laughs> the kind that the Army uses? Well, they're the same, by the way. Uh, the same contractors that the Army used, I use. So you say it doesn't exist, the technology doesn't exist? The, te the technology at the time, the technology is getting better. And one question I hope the committee will explore is what are the most advanced techniques that could be used to reach down further and see better? So what would be the evidence then of whether or not uh, th there was anything harmful there if it was, that, if it was buried that deep? Well, unfortunately, the only evidence you'd find that it's harmful would be in groundwater monitoring, and that I know is going to be discussed later. Uh, if you detected in groundwater monitoring wells uh, chemicals, that would be one indication. But if these things are intact, as they've found intact shells elsewhere in this area, you won't know until you actually dig it up what's there. Well, uh, is it clear that the perchlorate in the groundwater uh, is traceable to the ordinance? Uh, likely, not sure. Uh, one thing that we do know is perchlorate was used in fuses, the fusing of, of uh, artillery. So it seems likely that it comes there, but uh, I know other members have had perchlorate in their districts. It comes from a vari wide variety of things. Likely, Congresswoman, likely. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how would, given what, what you say about a site like this where uh, there can be ordnance buried so deep that it might never be found, uh, we are faced with uh, the question of whether uh, the, the site should, the, the Army Corps should leave the site. How are we to know whether the Army Corps should leave the site and, and, try and, and engage in some lesser uh, activities such as, for example, monitoring? Mm. There are two criteria that um, uh, Superfund type uh, uh, situations would suggest. One is if the groundwater uh, wells that are being dug and going to be dug uh, show uh, contaminants that are bo below the risk-based criteria set by EPA in Region 3, then you have some assurance uh, that uh, the groundwater that goes eventually into the Potomac and other areas uh, would not be uh, a concern and things aren't leaching into there. Uh, it's a much diff more difficult question, Congressman, for buried munitions to, f to find out what the criteria for that is. But I, my personal criteria is that if uh, advanced geophysical techniques are used in the spots where historical evidence and photographic evidence show them to be, and uh, there is finding of nothing. Said, I, I thought you said what, the, 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 that the, the equipment was, was, was not. Um, at the time, the, at the, most of the geophysical activity was taking place over the last 10, it, it, ten years ago. Uh, the, the number of new geophysical uh, uh, investigations, I really don't know, but certainly a number of the or original uh, geophysical mapping uh, was with uh, technology that's fairly old. May, may I add to that? Yes, Ms. Mattel. I, I really think there's three things that you need to consider based on our experience with sites nationwide. One is the transparency of the decision making. And I think both of you mentioned that earlier, that it's really important that now as the Corps makes a decision to leave the site, that it shares the information that it is using to make that decision with regulators. One of the things that we found nationwide was that the Corps often doesn't involve the state regulator and EPA in that decision making process. And it's very important that they do that because the state regulators and EPA can ensure that the actions that the Corps has taken comply with the regulatory standards. And what we have found nationwide is that more often than not does not happen. So that transparency is really important before the decision to leave the site happens. The second thing that we would strongly recommend is that they should share with the community and the stakeholders a long-term monitoring strategy. Obviously, there's a lot of things that we don't know about the site. We don't know where they're buried. But in the event that some new hazard is detected in the future, there should be a robust long-term monitoring strategy for the site. The last thing that I would recommend is that this core really needs to do extensive outreach with the with the residents of Spring Valley. One of the things that we found when we did our nationwide work is that the Corps often doesn't contact the property owners and tell them how and what they should do in the event that additional contamination is discovered. So we really believe that before the Corps pulls out, they really need to make that outreach to the residents because it's a, it's a, it's a partnership. The residents ha can help the Corps identify new hazards if they come available, but they have to know who to contact and what to do in that kind of situation. So those are three things that we would definitely recommend. I thank you, and I know I'm, I'm over time, and, and I, I just want to clarify uh, one thing in that answer, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, importantly, uh, um, your, what you've just said, uh, which mentioned the regulators, suggests that the Corps should not leave on the basis of its own uh, evaluation, but only after regulators have certified that in their independent judgment it is safe to leave at this point. Is that, is that your testimony? We think that it, it, it will add to the public's confidence in what the Corps has done if the regulators are involved in that decision-making process. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you. Let me just, again, for a further clarification on the last question. I know that uh, in my own district back in Massachusetts, uh, we had a similar situation, although it was private oil companies uh, that had caused the problem back then. Uh, to assure the, the local community, uh, you know, sometimes the community views federal agencies 
as the same. It's all the federal government. And so sometimes, unfairly or not, there's, you know, the suspicion that there might be collusion there among the federal agencies. And so uh, especially in cases like this where mistakes have been made, the lack of trust can be pernicious. And uh, we found that in, in at least one of those cases, uh, we were able to appoint uh, an independent licensed site professional to actually be chosen by the local community, someone, a licensed, qualified professional, to actually, I think, look behind all of the, all of the data, all of the research, and to really give an extra level of approval to the, you know, the, the cleanliness or the, the uh, remediation that had occurred. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you might, might recommend here? I think it makes a lot of sense to do something like that. In our work, what we have found is that the state regulators can oftentimes provide that balance as well because the state regulators have a responsibility to ensure that whatever cleanup has been done has been done according to state requirements. Right. And so they, they can provide that distance between the federal entities versus the community. So you, they, could, they could function in that form as well. Right. Uh, and I do, in closing, I do want to say I, I was uh, happy to hear your recommendations regarding ongoing monitoring. Uh, you know, I, I hope the agencies were listening closely at that, that suggestion because I think it's a, it's a solid one. At this time, I'd like to yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank you and Delegate Norton for uh, prompting this hearing for, for bringing this important issue uh, to this committee uh, and uh, Delegate Norton is to be commended for representing her constituents. Um, Ms. Mattel, let me, let me ask you, do you, would you characterize the uh, uh, DOD and the Army Corps' behavior uh, in this issue as irresponsible uh, as reckless, uh, as one that endangers the lives of citizens in this community and in others? That, that's a hard question to answer. What we have found is that the Spring Valley site is actually one of the better sites when you look at the national pro profile of FUD sites. Um, the Baltimore district is one of the districts that we have highlighted has been very proactive in reaching out to the states that it works with. Um, the, the, the core EPA and the district established a partnership, which is very rare across the country, to actually work together on the site. Um, the core also established a means of communicating with the public. That is also very rare across the country. Um, the other thing that we've noticed is that this has been a site that has received extensive funding. It is a high priority site and it receives funding before a lot of the other sites nationwide. So it's very hard to make that sort of statement knowing that there's a lot of positive things that have happened at this site which we don't see happening across the country. Sure and uh, I can I can sure, certainly share uh, share an experience with you that I had a couple of years back about a munition site uh, that was active during World War II and was just left there uh, with contaminants. Uh, and uh, uh, in, the, in the first CD of Missouri, uh, we had an environmental cleanup of a munitions plant. Uh, we, and, and, and the community still has some concerns uh, in St. Louis of chemical contamination in the soil the groundwater contamination and testing of residents uh, for health reasons. Could you supply us with, with documentation on the follow-up testing uh, and assessments that were done on the St. Louis Army ammunition plant? It's called the SLAP site. Uh, and can you inform me of the follow-up testing on groundwater and if it has been done with the state-of-the-art isotopic analysis uh, that will be used in Spring Valley. 
Uh, and will we or do we already have a remedial investigation uh, report that summarizes all samplings, all cleanup actions taken, and include a baseline human health and environmental risk assessment? Could you I, help me with that? I can tell you, sir, that we probably don't have that sort of detailed information. We only end up collecting that kind of information from the agency when we are asked to review a particular site in detail. We have not looked at the St. Louis site in detail, so it would be very, we would not have that information available to us right now. Um, I'm sure that the Corps could provide that information to you much faster than if we went to the Corps and then got the information. So I would strongly recommend asking the Corps for that information. Okay, I'm, I'm asking you here in this hearing, and I'm going to ask the Corps next when they get up here. Uh, but, but, you know. We'll be happy I, to work with you. The experience in St. Louis has been uh, that they, they did some some cleanup of the site and quickly rushed uh, to transfer the property, property to the state of Missouri, uh, who is now trying to peddle it off to the city of St. Louis. I mean, that's irresponsible behavior when you think about it. Uh, when you think that this site has sat there for 60 years, uh, didn't have the decency to clean it up, uh, to make it safe for the surrounding community, uh, and now I want to peddle it off to the state and to the local community. Uh, I, I think it's reckless behavior, uh, and I think it's irresponsible, and you show no respect or, or for health and safety of that community. You do have a responsibility when you contaminate a community, and you, and you need to clean it up. Clean up your mess. Clean up your waste that you leave there. Don't just leave it for somebody else. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's tragic, uh, and I can't wait to get to the next panel. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my questions uh, go to Mrs. Uh, Mittel. Is that correct pronunciation? Yes, that's correct. Um, did you have access to the records of the Department of Defense going back to um, 1916, 1917? When we did our original, when we did our original Spring Valley review, is that? We had access to all of the department's records were there, on the site. Uh, when you said on site, are you talking? For what, the site, whatever was in the file for the site, we had access to that information. And, and are you confident that you looked at each and every record that was available through the Department of Defense, that there weren't any records that were shielded from your attention based on uh, what may have been at that time national security concerns that may have uh, continue to exist even though it was so many years ago? I am quite confident that if we were aware that something existed, that we would have had access to it and that we would have been able to obtain it. Um, I did not personally work on the project at that time, so I can't confirm what everything we looked at, but I can. Co I am quite confident that if we were aware that a document existed, we would have obtained There weren't any to projects it. labeled top secret uh, at that time, but to assume if you have a munitions uh, and a chemical uh, weapons facility that was operating at that time that it may have been a, a top secret. Uh, it, is, it, is it possible that any uh, information that may exist has not been seen by the GAO that might be relevant to this investigation? I will double check and get back to you that on that, be, sir. I, I, I think that would be good if you did that. Uh, okay. But with the even, idea that it may be a separate classification that could have been for just the knowledge of a few people only, and well, because so much time has passed, it may still be there. Uh, and the reason why I raise this question is this. Have you, have you um, had access to any uh, longitudinal studies, any epidemiological studies uh, relative to people who, who are in the uh, Spring Valley area? 
and have we, been in the Spring Valley area when, since uh, it's been built up? When we did the 2002 work, a lot of the studies that have happened have happened after that, so we did not, we did look at the earlier work that had been done, but not the ones that have been done subsequently. Were, were, were students at uh, American University who may have been in and around the grounds uh, there over the period of time that we have knowledge that this existed, uh, were students uh, surveyed or canvassed uh, to see if uh, they may have any adverse health effects as a result of coming into contact with uh, some of the sites? You mean as part of our study? No, we did not do that. Do you know of any public health studies that, are, that have been done to, uh, uh, that, that go uh, beyond the, um, um, the testing that the university testifies to? They tested defined campus populations for arsenic poisoning. I believe um, the ATSDR did a study where they sampled uh, students that had been around the American University campus at the Children's Development Center. So there was a comprehensive study done by ATSDR. And, and, but have there, have there been any other studies in terms of uh, long-term studies? Because some of these uh, chemicals are, uh, uh, you know, are bioaccumulative and uh, you may see effects later on in life and not okay. see them immediately. We are not, I'm not aware personally of any of those studies. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I just uh, uh, call it to your attention. I mean, you, you've been doing much more work on this and are much more familiar with it than I am, but I just wanted to uh, raise for the attention uh, of the chair and members of the committee that it might be helpful to find out uh, what other kind of public health studies that uh, relate to the population on, in the spring uh, Valley area, including the students at uh, American University, over a period of time, and people that were uh, post, uh, that are graduates of the university, just to kind of take a long period of time and see if any particular types of um, incidents show up of certain kinds of diseases or ailments. I, I'm, uh, uh, my time has almost expired. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the work of this committee and for uh, GAO's uh, uh, continuing interest in this. The, the fact that this was not discovered, uh, that this was discovered by accident in 1993 uh, should give all of us on this committee pause about uh, other uh, sites uh, that are uh, formerly used defense and uh, military munitions sites. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for no, I, I thank the gentleman, and we will follow up on the, the health information uh, as to what, what might be available. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. I thank the chair, and I, I particularly want to thank the chairman for holding these hearings that are clearly of importance to all of us in the National Capital Region, especially those who live in the District of Columbia. I have an opening statement, Mr. Chairman, and I would ask unanimous consent that it be entered into the record at this point. Without objection. I thank the Chair. Um, Ms. Mattel, um, how many such sites might there be that we know of throughout the United States where we have either unexpended ordinance or testing grounds that could negatively affect residential communities? I would have to go back and double check on how many affect residential communities. I do not have that information. I do know that there are 4,700 sites in the, that are considered formerly used defense sites in the CORE's database. Um, are you aware of anybody who has disaggregated those 4,700 sites in terms of who they impact? I'm, I'm sure that information can be derived. I, I, if you could get it back to the committee for, sure. for the record, that would be very helpful because trying to look at the scope of the problem. And, and if I could follow up on something Congressman Clay was asking you about, um, when a property owned by the federal government, any part of the federal government, uh, including the military, the Army, uh, uh, has, uh, if it's discovered after a transfer, subsequent to the transfer to a local government or to a private entity, that in fact there's some kind of environmental problem, legally, who has the obligation to clean that up? To clean it up, um, if, if it's determined that the site was owned by the government and controlled by the government and that the activity that caused the contamination was a result of government activity, then it is the federal government that has responsibility under CERCLA to clean it up. And that's understood in the 
whatever contractual arrangement there is in the transfer. Is that correct? I believe so. I mean, I, I have an experience locally here uh, at the Lorton Prison site uh, that was transferred to um, our county, to Fairfax County. And when we discovered certain environmental problems on the property, it was the responsibility, nonetheless, of the federal government, uh, the transferring agent, uh, to clean up that, that site. Um, and so um, I assume similar provisions uh, apply to any federal agency that may own such land. I, I'm familiar with the CERCLA requirements, but Mr. Bailey well, might be. Uh, Congressman, this is a, a much more unique situation. And here the, the American University Experiment Station was leased by the Army from American University. And private landowners around the area then conveyed their property to property owners. And American University, of course, uh, conveyed property to subsequent. The problem, of course, is that there weren't a failure, there was a failure to disclose a dangerous condition, as the law requires in D.C. law, federal law, there's a uh, requirement to disclose a dangerous condition. That was never done here. That's the essence of the entire problem. Yeah. It's a very good point you're making. And, Mr. Chairman, it sounds to me like this may be one of those areas that needs to be clarified in the law, given the fact that, as Ms. Mattel said, though we don't know how many impinge on or are uh, connected to residential communities, if there are 4,700 sites, one can imagine there could be other similar such problems. Um, did I understand you, Ms. Mattel, to respond to uh, the uh, gentleman from Ohio's query that there has not been a comprehensive health assessment uh, of nearby residents and students attending American University with respect no, to No, there the actually have been a couple of studies done. One was done by ATSDR. Another one was done by Johns Hopkins. What I think the senator, what the congressman was asking was long-term studies. I am not aware of any ah, long-term studies. Following the long-term yes. effects. Okay, gotcha. I understand. Um, all right. Um, I'm, like, uh, like my colleagues, if I can, I'm going to uh, wait for other questions for, uh, uh, for the next panel. But I thank you both for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. There being no further uh, members with additional questions, I, I do want to uh, ask you each. Uh, obviously, we did not exhaust all areas of inquiry. If there, I'd like to give you an opportunity, just three minutes each. If there are areas of your testimony that have not been uh, touched upon uh, adequately, if you want to amplify a certain area that I think is very important that hasn't, you know, in an area that hasn't been asked, but. Uh, you know, I appreciate the frank testimony by each of our witnesses on this panel. And uh, Ms. Mattel, I'd like to allow you three minutes if there are some areas of, of concern that you have that haven't been touched upon yet uh, at this hearing. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think the important thing to remember is that these are not easy sites to clean up. We do not have comprehensive information. Uh, the contamination occurred 75, 90 years ago in some cases. The technological of um, capacity that we need to detect, identify, and then actually do the cleanup is not always there. And so we just need to recognize that this is a very complex and challenging process, and that it is not always easy for the Corps to know everything that they possibly need to know when they start cleaning up a site. So I just want to emphasize that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Bailey? I would just add that the Congresswoman's woman's points about the uh, lack of a state involved in this process is, is something that uh, I, I urge you to cover more. The amount of resources the District of Columbia has had to devote to o independent oversight have been limited. Um, you know, it is, I, I do sites all around the country, and this is a unique site in the respect that other sites have uh, the great resources, both scientific, analytical, legal, uh, to uh, employ independent oversight and make sure that the Corps is doing the right job. Uh, unfortunately, that has been lacking in this case, in my view, and I would urge the committee to uh, question other witnesses on that particular point. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. At this point, I would like to uh, dismiss our first panel. Thank you for your, your uh, willingness to come forward and help the subcommittee with its work. Uh, we bid you good day. And with that, I'd like to call up our second panel.